Heavenly Father, it is for me a, a delight to be able to invite someone in who has uh, written a book that has been impactful for me. And so I'm grateful for this, Father. I pray for this service. I pray for Roger. I pray that the words that you have given him uh, will be your words, that will be your wisdom. Uh, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd be moving in our hearts and minds as well as we are uh, receiving from you what you have planned for us. And so, Lord, we pray in this, in this place today that we would receive everything you have planned, that we would hear your voice, that, um, that Roger would just have those words um, that are from you, that are anointed from you. And so we pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Roger, let me grab you that stand. All right, thank you. Good morning. Cochrane Alliance Church, and for those of you online, welcome. You are in a series called Abide, and I've been invited to be the closer. This is the last hurrah in your journey exploring what it means to abide in Jesus. So my wife, Gail, and I, she's here with me. We uh, live up the road in Calgary. Or Calgary. Uh, we're in Calgary a lot, in Airdrie, as a matter of fact. And uh, before we moved to Airdrie, around 15 years ago, we lived in Kelowna for 22 glorious years. People say, well, why did you move to Alberta? Because the Lord guided us here. <laughs> But uh, we had some of the best years of our life. Our children grew up in Kelowna and the Okanagan. And when I think of the word abide, it depicts that metaphor that Jesus pointed to that you started exploring regarding what it means to connect with Jesus in a way that brings life and vitality and fruitfulness in your life, John 15 that when we abide in Jesus, we are abiding in a vine where there's an organic spiritual connection where we are connected to him and he bears luscious fruit in our lives. And so when, for those of you that have traveled to the Okanagan, you know it's wine country, it's apples, it's oranges, it, not oranges, but uh, apples and peaches and cherries and, and glorious fruitfulness up and down the Okanagan Valley. And when we think of the Christian life, we think of fruitfulness and vitality. What does it mean to abide in Jesus? And how do we bear much fruit? Last week, Pastor Brett, who I so appreciated in his heart, we had a time together here a couple months ago where we sat in his office and just compared our journeys and how he moved from Drumheller and we moved from Kelowna and together we're positioned in this location and near Calgary and exploring what does it mean to be the people of God on a pathway of renewal? How do we connect with the presence of God? How do we pursue God's presence in such a way that it's life-giving, it's impactful, it's fruitful in our lives? And so I applaud you, uh, Cochrane Alliance, as you are on this pathway of a journey of seeking God. He's invited me to really explore this vast topic on the topic of holiness. I work with the Evangelical Fellowship of Canada as the prayer ambassador, so I've got the privilege over the last four years since I was a district minister here in Alberta with the Baptist Conference of Alberta and got to know a lot of Alliance leaders. I was an Alliance pastor actually in Vernon uh, a number of years ago and uh, love the Alliance, by the way and I've got lots of Christian Missionary Alliance friends and colleagues, and uh, Blake and Kathy here, friends of ours that are also part of the Alliance uh, missions uh, team uh, in Cuba and Mexico, and, and just how the Alliance is known really for missions, but also for spirituality. I don't know if you know your Alliance history. When you go back into A.B. Simpson and out of the holiness movement, emerged in a number of different traditions, the Salvation Army, the Nazarenes, the uh, Christian Missionary Alliance, and then later the Pentecostal movement and such. And these also were birthed during a time of tremendous uh, cultural turmoil 
Well, there was a lack of sanctification. There was a lack of purity in the houses of God. And so out of that emerged the Christian Missionary Alliance where there is based around this idea of being wholly sanctified and consecrated and purified from the inside out. That Jesus is our savior, he's our sanctifier. He's also our healer and our coming king. And as we press into prayer and, and pursuing the presence of God, we are invited into the, the holy presence of God where it is transformational, it's impactful, it's full of life and light and love and power and glory. And the effervescence of God is part of who he is. The essential nature of God is that he is holy. So this morning, I'm going to leave you with a key text, and there's other texts that support this text. But if you would turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews 12, verse 14 is sort of this positioned text that has strategic importance with respect to the nature of the pursuit of God. And the writer to the Hebrews spends a number of chapters articulating how Jesus Christ is the supreme and, and sufficient Lord of all. He's the high priest. He supersedes Moses and the law. He's really the fulfillment of the Levitical sacrificial system. And really the entire Old Testament points to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is what Paul describes for us. He is our justification. He is our sanctification. He is our redemption. And there's this Verse 14, that's tucked right in the middle of chapter 12, that says that we are to pursue peace with all people and holiness. One verb governs both objects, present tense. There is this ongoing, continuous, intentional, striving, pursuing, racing after. If you think of the hound racing after the hare, that's the language of here, that we are to pursue peace and holiness. And by the way, they go together. Wherever we experience the shalom, wherever we experience the peace and the presence of God, we experience holiness. And if there's a lack of peace in our midst, if there's a lack of peace in our churches or in our families or in our community or in our country, you can rest assured there's a lack of holiness because peace and holiness go together as twins. And we are called to pursue peace with vigorous intentionality. We pursue a lot of things, don't we? We pursue careers, we pursue education, we pursue position, we, sometimes we pursue people <laughs> for a relationship. But do we pursue God? Are we hard after God? Do we seek him with all of our hearts? And do we pursue holiness? What is holiness? You know, this is one of those sacred words that is all encompassing. It's not ritual, it's not rules and regulations and sort of pinning the Ten Commandments to our fridge door and trying to abide by the Ten Commandments. I mean, that's a good thing to do. But at the heart of holiness is the, the magnificent perfections of God, the radiance of his glory, the power of his presence. That when you think of holiness, think of proximity to God. We can think of purity, and certainly purity is part of what it means to be holy, and God is pure, he's undefiled, he's full of light. But holiness is really separation, it's to be separate from, and be consecrated and set apart for God. You think of a styrofoam cup, a common cup, common use, profane use. But then you think of a gleaming porcelain teacup that's placed in royalty, places of dignity and honor and special use. 
To be a holy people is to be separated from that which is like a common Tim Hortons coffee paper cup to being a porcelain china teacup in Buckingham Palace. It's set apart for sacred use. It has honor. It has dignity. Holiness has elegance. It has beauty. It has charm. When people are holy, they radiate the character of Jesus Christ. Are you pursuing holiness? It says that if we do not pursue holiness, we do not see God. Purity enhances perception. We see God in the sense of our spiritual eyes. We detect God at work around us, in us, through us. There's perception where we are aware of the work of God and the presence and power of God in a way that is compelling. Holiness invites us to be able to see God. It says in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. How's your heart? Is it pure? Is it undefiled? Is it fixed on Jesus? Are you being transformed by the, in, the, in the inside out to become holy and to become righteous? Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. I want to drop a, a theological sort of explosion into your heart that you may or not be aware of this. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 says this. It's a prayer at the very beginning it's this accolade of the, the bounty and power of God who sits in the heavenlies and says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now watch this that we should be holy. And blameless before him. Do you know that the goal of salvation is not heaven? The goal of salvation is holiness. Oh yeah, the ultimate destiny of where we will spend eternity is heaven on earth, the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven, where there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. But the destiny of the redeemed and the overarching decree and plan of God is for holiness. Think of this. Before the universe was, God was. What was God doing? Don't know. Father, Son, and Spirit existed before the universe was created. From eternity past, God had no beginning. But in his divine counsel and in his divine purposes and divine plan out of love, he decided to create the universe to create people that would reflect his image and his glory. And part of that plan of creation, God knew that there would be a fall and there would be a plan of redemption whereby he would call his people to live a life of holiness. And he calls them, elects them into Jesus Christ for holiness. So from eternity past, God had you and I in mind to become holy. That's a priority in God's kingdom and redemptive agenda is that you and I, though we are destined for heaven, we are destined for holiness. We are to be holy people in Cochrane, holy people at work, holy people at school, holy people in the universities, holy people in our neighborhoods, holy people that have the radiance of the glory of the power of God emanating and gleaming from our lives in such a way that people are attracted to Jesus Christ because of his character that they see inside of us. 
Now, we live in a culture that is fraught with all sorts of competing agendas for our soul and our morality. Look in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. I want to zero in on one part of how holiness affects our morality. It affects every part of who we are, that we are to have holy minds, holy hearts, holy hands. And many of us want to know what the will of God is. What's God's will for my life? How do I find God's will? What is his purposes for me? Where do I work? Where do I live? How do I make this decision? Who do I marry? Sometimes we need the counsel and the wisdom of God to inform us, but There are other things that are plain in Scripture in terms of here's the will of God. Here's what God decisively is committed to. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 4 says this, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, (laughs) your holiness. God wants us to be sanctified, purified, cleansed from the inside out. He wants us to be men and women of integrity, of virtue. In a key area, that you abstain from, the word is porneia. That's where we get the word pornography, but it's broad. The word porneia refers to premarital relationships, Postmarital relationships, adultery, bestiality, and all forms of sensual engagement that doesn't fit the holy character of God. Common law relationships are not holy. Premarital interactions between men and women are not holy. Once we are married and we have temptations and other things that come along our way that can sometimes lead people astray into adultery is not holiness. God's character is consecrated. He is set apart from all that is undefiled. That is, he's absolutely pure and impeccable with magnificent perfection. So he invites us to say no to the lusts of the flesh. In fact, for me, I grew up as a pagan, basically, in Southern California. Dark lifestyle. People ask me, Roger, what, 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 what's, your, what's your background? My background's pagan. Bad boy. Immoral. Drug lifestyle. Alcohol lifestyle. High school. Dealt drugs in high school. Grew up in the 60s in Southern California, Jesus Revolution, the, you know, that whole sort of era back then, you know, long hair and, you know, the me culture, the hippie culture and free love, all the rest of it, pornography, all the rest of it, not good. Until Jesus decided to invade my space and called me into his kingdom, I was stoned on LSD on a Friday night. A friend of mine became a Christian saw a huge change inside of his life, and he came and he began to share the gospel with me. I'm peaking on acid. He starts to tell me about Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden the penetrating conviction of the Spirit came into my life for the first time, and I felt the presence of God was so strong. I just looked up in the heaven, and I went, I grew up in Glendora, California, and I looked up into the sky, said, in the midnight sky, and I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to believe. Well, from that point on, He began to consecrate me and purify me and pull me out of that lifestyle of sin and, you know, uh, lifestyle that was very dishonorable and began to change me from the inside out. I'm no longer the person I once was, just like many of you. You know, you've, you've come out of very immoral backgrounds. Some of you are caught in, you know, looking at websites and looking at saucy pictures and things that just feed and aggravate 
the inner life that Jesus gives us the power and the presence of his spirit and his word to help us to say no to these temptations. And that it says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 4, that each one of you would know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. So when we pursue holiness, without which we won't see God, it includes our moral life, our sensual life, our relationships with other people, what we look at, what we take in, the type of movies that we watch, the type of music that we listen to, the type of TV programs that can aggravate us and, and draw us away from the purity of Jesus Christ. But how do you do this? So it isn't just by our iron will determination and willpower and saying no and sort of toughing it out. It's not easy. I want to leave you with a quote. This is an important, important principle from John Wesley, who's one of my great heroes of the Methodist faith. Uh, and he was a, a specialist <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways when it came to holiness, holiness of heart and hands. John Wesley said this. You can put the uh, uh, slide up. He said this, that the neglect of prayer, the neglect of prayer is a grand hindrance to holiness. I don't know about you, but prayer can sometimes be a sort of secondary discipline in the Christian faith. We can study the Bible, we can worship, we can uh, listen to good sermons and podcasts and read good books and, you know, really press into the spiritual disciplines and such, and there's many. But at the heart of all that is the life of prayer. Jesus said, my house should be a house of prayer. He didn't say it'd be a house of study or of preaching or of worship or of lit liturgy. All that can be part of the house, the temple presence of God. But at the very center of the kingdom agenda that God has given is that we can communicate and have communion with him through the context of prayer. Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, that the Colossian church should devote themselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. We're told in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, that the apostles, though they were being overrun by the challenges of care for the Greek widows that were being overlooked with the daily dis distribution of bread, that he would delegate that to Greek leaders who were full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. But they say, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so prayer is this supernatural gift that God has given to us, Paul says, to pray without ceasing. That we connect into the lifeblood of the presence and power of God. He releases the capacity for us to have the ability and the power to walk in holiness. The neglect of prayer, we get busy, we get overrun, we get disappointed. I'm sure there are times where we feel like prayer doesn't work. But when we're consistent in prayer and we see God moving us forward and having answers and, and getting breakthrough, we begin to see that his life takes on a shape inside of our lives that works from the inside out. James 4.8 is a, is a passage that I've been praying uh, quite a bit lately when it talks about prayer. It says in James 4.8 to uh, come near to God and he will come near to you. Come near to God and he draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, look at the inner life. Is it pure? Is it undefiled? Is it focused upon pursuing the presence of God? Or is it fraught with temptation and, and lustful ideas and, and anger and, and angst and uptightness and the kinds of things that aren't 
fitting for the people of God. Our hands, you know, think of uh, the priest who comes into the temple precinct. He washes hands in the labor. labor. It's, it's the same imagery of the priest coming forward with a sacrifice and worship, pure and clean before God in his holy presence. And remember COVID, we, you know, we're still washing our hands and trying to get rid of the different diseases and germs that we can pass on to other people. It's the same way in our lives is that there has to be this daily renewal of repentance through prayerfulness, we come before the Lord, we draw near to God, he draws near to us. We confess our sin and he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He purifies us from the inside out, our hands and our hearts. I pray this on a regular basis. And I think of Psalm 139, verses 29, 23 and 24, where the different monastic traditions use this, they call it the prayer of examine, that often in the evening I'll take some time, even before going to bed, and I'll just think through Psalm uh, 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, O God, and see if there's any grievous ways within me and lead me on the way of everlasting. In other words, Lord, take the searchlight of your presence and point to those things that are offensive to you, those thoughts, those attitudes, those behaviors, those offenses that I've created with my wife or my friends or colleagues or people that I come into contact with that I need to get forgiveness and and seek restoration and reconciliation. Lord, what are the things inside of my life? What What are the idols in my heart that I need to confess and displace, that I would walk in the beauty of the power and presence of God in holiness, that we would walk in the light that is he is in the light, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that we're a holy people. Pursue holiness in Cochrane Alliance, in your personal life in your marriage, in your family, in your parenting, at work. <clears throat> Are you honest or just honest at work? Here's tax season. For those of you that work in the uh, restaurant industry, you know, we're supposed to itemize the tips and, you know, the service industry and such, and yet we can cut corners and, and sort of, you know, not trust God to supply. Where is the integrity of our heart? How do we explore what holiness looks like in the context of everyday living? How many of you are familiar with the Asbury outpouring at the Asbury University campus in Wilmore, Kentucky, uh, about a year ago? So in early February of 2023, Zach McCreebs, who was an Alliance leader in Kentucky and a uh, church uh, consultant and missions leader and such, spoke at their uh, chapel at uh, Asbury University. Let me put the next slide on because it shows you a picture. If you see the top left there, that's actually Asbury University and seminaries there, uh, Methodist school. And... Uh, so he spoke a pretty, uh, you know, pretty average chapel service on Romans chapter 12 and about how we need a revival of the love of God and love for each other. And, and uh, at the end of his chapel service, I think it was on February the 8th, uh, he invited, you know, students to respond and people began to leave uh, Hughes Auditorium. And there was about 19 students that stayed behind. And they gathered in the middle and they began to pray and, and uh, confess their sin and they were under the conviction of the Spirit. And then the presence of the Lord just kind of moved in, settled in on these 19 students. And they didn't leave. They stayed there for hours. Things started happening. They started weeping and confessing and praying and seeking the face of God. So then they started texting, inviting other students and faculty, and the word started getting out. 
So then all these students and faculty from all over the university, they all start coming back to Hughes Auditorium. So it fills back up. It holds about 1,500 people. Well, they didn't leave either. The Holy Spirit was so strong. The presence of God was so strong that people were under conviction. It wasn't about speakers and worship and, you know, high-profile people. It was common, ordinarily, primarily Gen Z university students who were doing business with God, or should I say God was doing business with them, and they were pursuing holiness. Well, the holy presence of God was so strong that people couldn't leave. They just started keeping the, the chapel going. So they'd quit like at two in the morning till about six or so so they can clean and you know go in the bathrooms and refurbish stuff. Then they'd all start coming back and pretty soon the word starts getting out. People are sending text messages and TikTok messages. It's getting all over the world. It starts getting onto television and radio and now people are flying from all over the world to Wilmore, Kentucky, population of 6,000, rural town. For 16 days, Sixty to 70,000 people showed up at that campus. This is in February. It was freezing cold, and there are people lined up outside for six hours to get into the chapel auditorium. If they couldn't get in, they just said, okay, we'll just kneel down and we'll, we'll bow before the Lord's presence on the lawn. They've now done documentaries and interviews of, and books and things that are coming out. They're really documenting what really happened. Legitimate move of God. At the heart of it, and this is what they say, is that God's presence was so strong, you could hardly move, you could hardly talk. All you could do is be on your face, all you could do is weep and confess and come clean and be pure before the Lord. A thousand people came to faith during that 16 day time. And it spread to other campuses and other places all around uh, the United States and, and other places. And people would walk by the auditorium and they could feel this gravitational Kavod, the weight of God's glory was so strong. Now, what would happen if God's presence so seized this congregation that people from all around southern Alberta lined up outside to get into this building? We know these things have happened in, in history with histories of revivals and renewals. I want to show you the picture that I love the most. Here's what it all comes down to. Next slide. That's in Hughes Auditorium. That's above the stage. So they got a pipe organ and they got the stage down below. And above the stage... It says, holiness unto the Lord. We can no longer live as we once did because we are no longer the people we once were. How does this work practically? If you're a single person, you live the single life. Time's your own, your priorities, your schedule, your finances, everything, your own space is your own. When you get married, you can no longer live as you once did. What happens if a single person gets married and still wants to live as a single person? No worky, right? People try it. They don't. You can no longer live as you once did because you're no longer a person you once were. If I was a pagan here and now I'm a Christian here, I can't live like a pagan anymore. I got to live like Jesus. 
the character of God, holiness. The destiny of Christians is holiness, not heaven. We're to pursue holiness. But holiness is elegant. It's full of glory. It's full of being saturated by the presence of God. (coughs) Peter says this, you should be holy. Why? Because God's holy. I want to pray a prayer over us this morning. A.B. Simpson built a whole theology of sanctification from this passage. And he wrote an entire book on it called Holy Sanctified, which I would recommend that all your members are required to read. Just saying. Listen to the text and absorb it into your heart as being your prayer as I pray. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Sanctification is not delegated or outsourced. It comes direct from God. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you and us completely, holy, consecrated, purified, cleansed, with the antiseptic of his Holy Spirit, And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God help us. Lord, we all have the contamination of sin and dysfunction and addictions and temptations and things that can defile us when we consent. Would you release a revival of holiness at Cochran Alliance and in our personal lives? in this city, in this province, across this country. Would you sanctify us completely and may our whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because he who calls us is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Worship team, thank you.